Good morning, everybody. Uh, buenos dias. Thank you all for, for joining us this morning. Uh, it's a great honor and pleasure to have with us the President of the Republic of Panama, Juan Carlos Varela. We're also delighted to welcome his distinguished delegation, including several ministers and other senior advisors this morning. President Varela has been in Washington since Monday when he met with President Trump and has had a full agenda with members of Congress and other senior administration officials. We're very grateful to him for setting aside some time to come to the dialogue to share his views about his country, its impressive progress and continuing challenges, and its evolving foreign policy agenda. This morning, President Varela will focus in particular on his government's role in strengthening regional security and stability. President Varela came to office in 2014, is an engineer by training, educated at the Georgia Institute of Technology, He's a successful businessman and has been a prominent political figure for decades. In the previous government, he served as foreign minister and also as Panama's vice president. Five years ago, the dialogue joined CSIS to host a conference called Panama Beyond the Canal, which informed Washington's policy community about Panama's sustained and impressive economic performance but also discuss the importance of reducing poverty and inequality and improving the rule of law. President Varela has sustained the country's positive economic record. I think this year expected to grow about 6%, which is the highest growth rate in Latin America. And he's also tackling the social agenda and pressing for greater transparency and accountability. As president, he's playing a more active role in regional affairs. He was the host of a very successful and historic Summit of the Americas uh, in 2015. And he's presided over a number of major infrastructure projects, notably the remarkable expansion of the Panama Canal, which has been such a critical engine for the country's economic growth, and as we all know, was built 100 years ago. The dialogue has had a long-standing commitment to Panama. We're very proud that our founding chair, Saul Linowitz, was the principal negotiator of the Panama Canal Treaty of 1977. Two former Panamanian presidents are dialogue members. And we have also worked very closely with Ambassador Manuel Gonzalez Rivila. And I want to thank him personally and his stellar staff for the close co cooperation and confianza in organizing this and other events. I also want to acknowledge our ambassador in Panama, our good friend, John Feely. And thank you for being here, John. <laughs> Mr. President, as your ambassador can attest, we always have this flag here. Uh, <laughs> It's not just for this special event. It's here all the time, even when you're here or you're not here. Please welcome and please join me in welcoming to the podium the President of Panama, Juan Carlos Varela. Good morning. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank Michael and the Inter-American Dialogue for giving this opportunity to share with you this moment, this morning here in Washington, D.C. And also, thanks to all of you for coming to this event. Michael, I came here five years ago in a very different situation. <laughs> I was Vice President of Panama and also one of the opposition leaders. So usually when you're the Vice President, <laughs> so it, was, it, was not, um, it was very difficult times for us at the time, and, and you gave us the space to debate here, it was, it was interesting. Some media people came, members of the government, opposition came, and we had a very interesting debate about democracy in Panama. And at the end, I ran a very difficult campaign against all the power of the state. 
against a lot of money from corruption, against all the structure of the government working against me, against my family, against my party, against my family business. And we, I felt the pressure when you feel all the pressure of the power of the state against you. And I kept fighting all the way to the end because I'm a strong believer because at the end, the state always wins. I heard that from a, a member of the mafia in Italy that <laughs> after prosecutors were looking for him for seven years, he turned in, he turned himself in. And what they asked him, why are you turning yourself in? He said, because at the end, the state always wins. So by being here today as president of Panama, I can say that Panama won May 4, 2014, because democracy won. Because today, we have a very strong democracy, you know, separation of power, independent con controller, independent attorney general, we respect the justice, we respect all these uh, democracy. That's the main reason why our economy is growing, our country is, is becoming a problem solver, not creating problems in the region. We are, that's the main message that I'm bringing to Washington, that I want to be a regional partner in helping solve different issues that affect or challenges that we have in the region. And that was the main agenda in the meeting with President Trump, with uh, the Secretary of the Treasury, the Homeland Se uh, Secretary of Homeland Security, and with all the U.S. government officials that Panama is a strong partner and that we're looking forward to work together with this administration in being, bringing social peace, stability, and strength and democracy in the region. So that's, that's, I feel very proud about my country, be very proud about what we did last year, concluding the expansion of the Panama Canal that now allows the U.S. to export LNG gas to Asia through the Panama Canal with this new big tankers also to export grains to Asia. And the impact of the expansion of the Panama Canal is going to be very important for trade, especially the East Coast and for the companies or states that are exporting LNG gas to Asia. And our country is strengthening everything, the economy, democracy. Our economy is growing 6.4%. Unemployment is less than 5%. Inflation is less than 1%. We've been able to receive more than 100,000 immigrants from Colombia, Venezuela, and Central America. In Panama, we were able to solve two crises last year of people uh, leaving Cuba, or leaving mainly Ecuador or other countries in the South trying to make their way to the U.S. And also we solved another crisis of people leaving Haiti, from Haitians leaving Brazil on the way to the United States. We got some help from Chile, because now they're going to Chile in that situation. But we are showing uh, the region, or the continent, that we are a very strong partner in you know, working together with other countries, with friend countries, to bring stability and peace to the region. So I really, it's an honor for me to be here and to share with you the success story that will be, in, as you know, last year, difficult times. We have to face just 0.02% of our economy is related to legal services. 99.8% of our economy doesn't have anything to do with legal services. And last year, we were almost defined by this scandal of, of a law firm that is not really Panama is not our economy, it's just a law firm selling corporations, and, and, and it was, that was a global problem, not a Panamanian problem, because it was a Panamanian law firm, then they tried to define that as a Panamanian problem. So we have to travel to Europe, Asia, the United States, send our team of people to many countries to defend our country, and to especially defend the Panamanian people that work hard every day to build a success story that is our country today. I'm gonna leave other issues. I know there, there's many issues, you know, the meeting with President Trump, Cuba, China, Venezuela, but I will leave that for the Q&A so I can focus on, on <laughs> because it will take the whole morning and I will allow Michael to do his job and also being able to interview me and get more, more information. Uh, so I will focus mainly on security, how Panama can help the region. As you know, our democracy started in 1989. It's a 28-year-old 20, uh, democracy. We have, I'm the sixth president elected by democracy during the democratic era. And today is the first time that a president elected uh, during this democratic period can say to the region that all the directors of, of our law enforcement agencies, even the Minister of Security, Alexis Betancourt, that is with us today, all of them are career officers. First time in Panama, the Director of Intelligence, Rolando Lopez, that is here with us today. All of them, all the appointees, all the people appointed to lead the different agencies are career people. So six law enforcement agencies in Panama and also the Ministry of Security, our career people, we spend more than $800 million. That's our budget, yearly budget for security. We have 26,000 members in our, law, in, law, in our agencies. 
And let me share this information with you. 6,000, which 4,000 border police and close to 3,000 Coast Guards, that, that's almost 35% of our forces are just dedicated to fighting drug trafficking and organized crime. That's a lot of, of effort involved. So I will say like close to 30% of, of our budget, 30 to 40% of our budget, of our security budget, goes to fight the fight against illicit trade of drugs and, and organized uh, crime. So that, that's a lot. That's a big effort that our country is doing to stop the flow of drugs from the producing countries to the consuming countries in the north. So I think that's a challenge that we have. And, and as I mentioned to President Trump, we face the same challenges. The increase in production of drugs, the political situation in Venezuela that now has become an economic situation and now a humanitarian situation, very difficult. That's the reason why we received more than 60,000 immigrants from Venezuela in just four years. And the situation in the North Triangle, that it's been just all these drugs flowing into the United States through Central America are creating a lot of problems to the to these states, especially to Salvador, Honduras, and Guatemala. A lot of money to, to corrupt uh, police officers, politicians, uh, businessmen. So that happens in Central America and also ha can happen in our country. So that's, uh, I will say that, that bringing development, economic growth, and stability to the North Triangle is a challenge for the United States, Mexico, and other countries. And also, you know, fighting against this increase in the production of drugs in the South, and also trying to solve the, the, the situation in Venezuela are the three challenges that we face. And they are the same challenges that the, the United States government faces in the region. So we have to, to share the, that to, the, together to be able to share what we're going to do together. And that was the main message that I brought to Washington in this visit. Key thing for North Triangle, I would say, is bringing new players, Chile, Argentina, other countries to help. It's not just a problem of the United States or Mexico. It's a problem of the continent. So when Colombia is, is not easy, it's a very difficult situation. We have to support President Santos to conclude the, his peace agreement and support the Colombian military on their fight against uh, drug traffickers. They're doing a, a good job fighting a new group called the Clan Usuga or Clan del Golfo on the Atlantic side. And we are coordinating with them. We're establishing uh, uh, many joint operations in the border to be able to stop them. And in Venezuela, as you know, there was some meeting of the OES uh, today and yesterday in Cancun. It was not, on the Venezuelan issue, it was not a successful meeting. There's a lot of debate going on right now, but I think that we have to keep working. We have to support the Vatican. The Vatican got involved in supporting the effort of the three former presidents, and I feel that we have to support the Vatican in the efforts to bring peace to Venezuela. Going back to security, Panama has seized uh, last year 75 tons of drugs. This year, as of today, close to 25 to tons of, of, of cocaine this, this year. And we have a success story fighting organized crime. When I uh, came to office in 2004, 14, homicide rates in Panama was 17 per 100,000 citizens. We reduced that to nine. So we got it in 45%. From 17 to nine per 100,000 citizens on the way to five, that is our goal. Today, we're one of, we're one of the safest country in America. How, how we did that? Um, mainly by investing a lot of government money in the areas of social risk. Convincing the, the youth and the young kids living in areas of social risk that it's better to be loyal to the state. You know, because at the end, when these kids grew, grow in these neighborhoods, they, there's a debate inside their mind, you know, should I be loyal to the drug kingpin or should I be loyal to the mayor, to the authorities, to the state? I, can, I have how to go to school, I can graduate, get married, have a decent life, or I will follow the drug traffickers and then just end up in jail or in the front page of a newspaper or, or, or in cemetery. So that's the fight that we have every day. And that's not a fight that you fight just with police, because that fight takes place in the mind of the young kids. So you have to go to them and convince them that the right thing to do and the only right track is to be loyal to the state and to live a decent life. So we did that, investing a, a lot of money uh, there, there's a city on, on the Atlantic side of Panama, Colón is the entrance city of the Panama Canal, and we are investing more than $1.2 billion in that city. We're building six to 7,000 new homes. The young kids at social risk, they are building their future and not destroying themselves. Uh, we are renovating the city. We passed a law that that city is gonna be free, uh, uh, duty free, the whole city. 
uh, we are supporting uh, the city to be like a home port for cruise uh, going through the Caribbean uh, and also using our air connectivity to support that effort. And the crime was reduced in that city by 50% in just three years. So we're going to recover a city back to the state of Panama. And that's a huge effort. And we have challenges because to put one kilo of cocaine into a container going to Europe in that city, the profit is a kilo of cocaine that costs $2,000 in Colombia or in Panama is worth $80,000 in that container. So imagine the amount of money that these drug dealers have to, to move that and to corrupt people because it's from 2,000 to 80,000 in just two pounds, one kilo of cocaine. That's a lot of money. So that's, that's what we're fighting, but we're successful and we have now, we're, we deploy special forces in that area. And because we have some challenges the first six months of this year, but I feel uh, that we are gonna achieve our goal. The, there, in Panama, GAN activity has been reduced by 30 to 40%. We were able to take th close to 3,000 uh, gang members and bring them to formal life to train them. We gave them some support, we trained them, and now they're working for construction companies, government contractors, and they're building their future and not destroying itself, as I said before. So that, that policy of uh, prevention and then firm hand is working, but there are challenges ahead because uh, the fighting against organized crime is a daily task. It's not something that you can say, oh, I'm successful, and then just know you have to keep working and, and you cannot stop. Um, this Colon story is a success story. The first uh, six months of this year, because of the increase of shipments of drugs, uh, trying to use our logistic platform to move drugs into our cities of Panama and Colon, we have to create like a different special groups. One was called the Eagle Task Force, special forces from different agencies together, and now they're fighting uh, these drug dealers. We we have we stay in an airport that we built in this, that was built by the past government in the city of Colón that's not being used now. Has, is now like a police headquarters. We have special forces there in Colón City. We we rented the best cars, bought them the best equipment, and that's thanks God as of today we haven't had a homicide in that city in close to 25 days. We used to have two or three per week. So we are just on top of it directly the president, the Minister of Security, the Director of Intelligence, all the agencies of our government collaborating very closely with the agencies of the government of the United States fighting these, these, these drug cartels. And also we create a special unit to fight corruption inside the police. So that's very important, to fight corruption inside the police and that's working and also another special unit just to get involved in the fight against uh, drug trafficking. Colombia is something that we have a very strong relationship and partnership with President Santos, and the, especially with the Colombian Armed Forces and the Colombian Police were very close with us. And I, thi I think that the peace uh, deal is, is a success story, but there are many challenges ahead because of, of this increase in drug production, and we have to face that together. And they are uh, conducting very important operations on the Atlantic side, fighting these groups that are the ones, especially what is called the Clan del Golfo, that's the one trying to get former FARC members to, to join them so they can help them in, in drug trafficking. But I think that uh, working very closely with Colombia, we're gonna have a success story there too, but there are challenges ahead. We also work with the United States, with the Amer the United States government on that, sharing intelligence and information. And one thing that I think is gonna be the, the challenge of the fight against organized crime and drug trafficking, one is reducing consumption, it means prevention. You know, we have to create conscience in the people that when they buy illicit drugs, they are financing terrorists. They are financing people that are killing people in our countries, you know, behaving people in Mexico, killing uh, people. So we have to, like, do a campaign together to convince people that every time they give money to a drug trafficker or somebody selling drugs on the street, they are financing people that are killing kids, that are killing families, that are uh, disappearing teachers. So that's very important to reduce the consumption of drugs so we stop the flow of money going to these drug traffickers. And that's one strategy. And the second one, I would say, will be following the money. You know, we have a very good effort by all the US law enforcement agencies in Key West, in Florida, it's called the Joint Interagency Task Force, JADA South. They put 34 agencies. Remember when Florida was a big problem 30 years ago, the famous Miami buys, and uh, Miami was out of control. That's, that's on the... Uh, <laughs> That's a TV show, but that's reality for, for the ones that we, when we are in public life, that now we see Pablo Escobar, is, well, you go you buy Netflix and you see Pablo Escobar, but for the Colombian police 25 years ago, that was not, that, that was real life, you know, seeing their friends being shot, 
seeing their, 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 their families being killed. So um, I, I think the U.S. created what it was called Yara South that's working perfectly in the tactical interdiction of drugs. But now I feel that we have to create the same interagency effort to follow the money and being able to dismantle these structures that support the drug traffickers. So chair, intelligence, technology, information, money always leave a trace, and then go after the money. So in that way, we can cut the flow of money to these drug cartels that are doing a lot of damage to the region. The North Triangle is, 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 a, is a big challenge. I will say that especially Guatemala. Well, I mean, Panama, as I mentioned before, is investing $800 million. You know, we're protecting, protecting our borders, our coast. But a lot of drugs is moving to the Pacific of Guatemala now, on the way to Mexico and the United States. So I think that of the countries of the region, Guatemala is one of the ones facing a big challenge. Michael told me about the, the meeting yesterday here about the matters. I feel that's, that's a challenge for the future. Why? Because many leaders of these matters are being deported back to their countries. And now they're going to try to, they were controlling the end part of the drug trafficking, the consumption in the United States. But now they're going to probably try to get closer to the production countries and then try to build like a, like a change chain all the way from the production countries to the United States. So that's a challenge that we're going to be facing in the future. And, but for the North Triangle, I will say that the best solution will be foreign investment, supporting private sector, creating jobs, creating prosperity, economic and social development in a sustainable way. That's the main thing that we have to see Central America as a region itself and, and be able to help these countries to move forward, support their economy, support trade. They have good labor. Many of the labor that comes to the United States and work in many different areas come from these countries. So I think the future of the North Triangle depends a lot on fighting inequality, not just fighting crime. Fighting inequality, not just fighting crime. Because a lot of wealth in few hands, and at the end, you don't leave choices to people but to go um, and, and, and do the, uh, illegal things. Venezuela is, 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 a, is something that I will say, I mean, I was, as you, all of you know, some of you know, well, I was Minister of Foreign Affairs at the same time that President Maduro was Minister of Foreign Affairs. So we met in, 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 in Cuba for the meeting of the Association of Caribbean States. We talk about uh, inviting the Vatican to get involved in supporting the dialogue that was started by three former presidents, uh, Fernandez, Torrijos, and Zapatero. He accepted that, the Vatican got involved. There was some dialogue for at least three or four months. There was some peace in the country. But suddenly, uh, uh, President Maduro decided to uh, call for this uh, new constituency assembly. And that just became, uh, started this conflict. More than 65 people has died. So Panama is, is supporting now the efforts of the, of the countries that are trying to stop that situation and especially stop that balance. And we have some difference, strong difference now because we are for me, saving life is the, uh, uh, the, uh, the first human right. So I mean, if, if I have to fight with somebody, even though we disagree in things, but if, we, if I do it trying to save life, I will do it. So the position of Panama with Venezuela now is that we have to, they have to call for elections. They have to release any people that is detained because for political purposes, and that President Maduro should uh, respect the electoral calendar that the constitu his constitution defines. And, if he doesn't do that, then what we will see is a situation that we see on the TV every day. And so we're in permanent contact with government officers and also with opposition officers trying to find a little space where we can jump in and try to stop this confrontation that is costing human life. Immigration is a big challenge uh, for Panama because, as you know, we are, when you have economic development, economic growth, a uh, nice city like Panama City, you know, opportunities, you know, we have a very strong air connectivity, we connect direct. 280 cities, uh, our main airline, Copa, flies close to 14 million passengers through the continent. The canal was just expanded. It's you know, giving $1.7 billion in net income to the state of Panama. We're using that money to invest in infrastructure, and that's the main reason why we uh, have this economic growth, too, and we're able to take care of the people. Our government is, is giving 100,000 homes to the people living that doesn't have any homes. It's giving 250,000 basic sanitation solutions to Panamanian families. It's building more than 30 kilome 26 kilometers of new metro lines. And also, expand we just expanded the canal. We're building a new bridge uh, over the Panama Canal. So we, we, our economy is moving forward. So that's probably many people from Central America and South America and Caribbean countries, they may come to Panama to find 
better days for their families. So immigration is a challenge for us. We received 100,000 immigrants in just five years, meaning the situation keeps deteriorating in Venezuela. We, can, we cannot receive one million people from Venezuela or half a million. There's no, we don't have the facilities. So now we, are, we move um, the time that we allow uh, people from these three countries, Venezuela, Colombia, and Nicaragua, that are the ones that bring immigrants to our country, we reduce the time that they can stay from six months through three months, and we are evaluating other measures if this flow keeps there. But we are a very strong party with the United States on the border with Colombia. We stop any immigrants coming from other continents. We do the fingerprints. We check who they are. We check if they represent any threat to our continent. Last, uh, last month, we deported 22 Pakistani back to Pakistan. It was a process that took more than one year negotiating with the Pakistani authorities. We are the first country that is deporting Cubans uh, that are trying to get to the United States. But we did it with a treaty that we signed with the Cuban government. Uh, and I think that Panama is doing the right thing in the border with Colombia and in the south border of, 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 of our south border to be able to, to stop this flow of illegal immigration. The cooperation with the United States government is a very strong cooperation. Panama has the presidency, and next week I'll be in San Jose, Costa Rica, receiving the presidency of the Central American system. And our idea is to work these six months as president of SICA, Central American Integration System, especially in security. And, we're going to, and the idea of that Panama is going to use is to bring other countries, especially Chile. We have uh, very good talks with President Bachelet, so we can get him the Carabineros involved, the same as the Colombian police is doing, to support train the police forces of Central America so they can fight and, and all these challenges that we're facing. We feel that also working together with Colombia, with Mexico, uh, Chile, Argentina, Peru is going to be very important uh, to the collaboration with the United States, but also working with all these governments. Last week, there was a very good meeting in Miami about the North Triangle. And, and, and the, the, what I like about that meeting is that all these countries were there. It was not just the US talking about the Alliance for Prosperity. It was also Chile, Peru, Mexico, other countries uh, uh, involved there. The collaboration with the US government is, is very strong. I spent uh, yesterday some hours at Homeland Security. As you know, to be able to protect our logistic platform, airports, port, the canal, we have to coordinate with the US agencies. We are the only country in the region that has the advanced passenger information system. Uh, we have used that system in the past five to six years. I, when I was Minister of Foreign Affairs, I, I was very involved in that process to be able to return more than 34 uh, thousand passengers that represent some kind of risk for our country, and we are going to keep uh, improving that collaboration to be able to protect uh, the, our country and the region. The creation of of new platforms that allow our country to exchange information uh, of intelligence with other countries is a challenge, and, and we're working on that. And as I mentioned, the next six months we're going to be very focused on our security. And there's a big opportunity because. In Poland, in July uh, last year, Pope Francis des decided that Panama was going to be the place, the host of the next World Youth Day. That means 500,000 young people from 192 countries coming to Panama in 2019, when Pope Francis is going to spend five days in our country, and these kids are supposed to stay more than two weeks. Huge opportunity to work closely with Central American countries, to work closely with different churches in the region, and Catholic priests and different people, uh, uh, leaders of young organizations, so they can come to Panama. And they can change their life. So Panama is going to be supporting social peace in this region by trying to promote this event, sending people to the most dangerous and poor neighborhoods of Central America and invite them to Panama. So we were going to use this event not just to have the Pope five days in Panama with this message, but also to try to invite young people from the region to change their life. It's a great opportunity for us and also a big challenge for, our, for our security structures to prepare for that event. And the collaboration with, with, with different governments is going to be very important for this matter. Um, the objective, the long-term objective, will be to strengthen our, our cooperation regional role. Uh, I remember when President Obama came to the Summit of the Americas, the uh, first question he asked me was, what do you need from me? And I, I told him, the only thing I need from the United States is to see us as a regional partner. See Panama as a country that is ready to give, not to ask. We are a country that we're ready to share the success story that we have. And also, when the Panama Canal became a part, a part of our country, 
we have received more than 12 to 14 billion dollars in incomes. That's the main reason why we've been able to invest a lot of money in the infrastructure in our cities and in our country. So now we want to share that. We want to share that success story, and our country is ready to be a, a, a responsible country that is willing to help other countries in the region. And we're uh, training our people to be responsible citizens of the world. We have sent 10,000. We're going to send 10,000 Panamanian teachers to the United States to learn English. We already sent 4,000 to the best universities in the United States so we can have a bilingual education so our people can talk to everybody, to the Americans, to the Chinese, because that's the language that we use to communicate with the United States and with China. To English is amazing because we don't, it's not easy to, to learn Mandarin or to learn our language. So we use English as a second language, and it's, that's the language that we communicate. Even many companies, international companies that are doing business in Panama, they use uh, English as, as a language to communicate. So that's the reason why we're very focused on this bilingual education project, So because we feel our country playing a key role in the region and in the world. Um, protecting our logistic platform, as you know, being so close to the producing countries, of the countries that produce drugs with uh, ports that get to 175 ports worldwide with an airport that gets to 80 cities in just one continent and five cities in Europe. That's a, that's a big opportunity, but also it's a big challenge to protect that logistic platform and make sure that it's not used for any legal purposes. So I will say that to co collaborate with the United States government to protect that logistic platform is key for us because we don't want the success story of our country to be related to nothing that is illegal. And to conclude, I will say that in this fight against organized crime and against drug trafficking, to follow the asset of these groups is key. It's key. The same way that we're sharing intelligence to be able to seize drugs, the same way that we're sharing intelligence to go after them, these criminals, I think that now using technology and following their money and dismantling their structures is very important. We have a very uh, success story in Panama of a group, an economic group that was included in the OFAC list and the Clinton list. And we were able to dismantle part of that uh, structure in a, with a, but protecting the jobs of innocent people. Because we have to make sure that the fight against corruption and the fight against an organized crime is popular, that people like it, that people support it. Because if you do it that way, then people become your partners, and they will help you in that fight. If you're alone in that fight, then it's very tough to win it. If you get everybody involved, you're sure that you will in that fight. And that's the main reason why I'm here today to share this vision with you and invite you to visit our country and also to help us move forward in building a success story in Panama and in the region. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, President Varela, for that uh, very interesting, wide-ranging uh, <clears throat> remarks on lots of issues. Um, I know people at the edge of their seat, they want to ask questions, but uh, if you allow me, maybe I could start the conversation and then we can open it up to, sure. to, to others. Um, <clears throat> the issue uh, of China, let's if we can okay. start with that. Obviously, you made an important uh, policy change or announcement. I'm interested in not the reasons why, but if you could tell us um, first what, what will be the practical, uh, you think will be the practical consequences of this policy change uh, in Panama, and two, how you see China's role generally, not only in Panama, but in Latin America, what it is now, where you think it's likely to, to go. Thank you, Michael. Uh, first, uh, I would like to share just the story of how we went to, to, to that decision. 2007, I was invited by Tim Shriver, the president of Special Olympics, to go to Shanghai for the War Games of Special Olympics. And I was very impressed, to be honest, with my visit to Shanghai and to Beijing. I saw how the Chinese were changing their economic system, how they were opening their system and bringing foreign investment and uh, supporting trade. So I, I met, uh, I saw also Tim Shriver negotiating with Taiwan how Taiwanese athletes will participate in that event. And at the end, they came to the conclusion that they could participate at Chinese Taipei. It was very nice to see the Chinese athletes and the athletes from Taipei behind them at Chinese Taipei. So I saw the future is there's, there's just one people. So when I went to Beijing, I met with the officials of the party. And then I publicly, I say, if I become president of Panama, I will move my relations. I will establish relationship with China. 
In 2008, President Mao won the election and the Kuomintang took power, and he, he established a demo, demo, diplomatic truce between China and Taiwan. It was very successful. Trade increased, tourism uh, exchange increased, foreign investment of Taiwan in China increased. It was a success story. You know, things were going well. They were taking care of themselves, strong dialogue, and suddenly the, the policy changed, and I advised at every moment in Taiwan East, if they break the diplomatic truce, Panama will move to China, will recognize China. And, and, and that's what I did. And I, I advised that to Taiwanese diplomats at the highest level, even to the president that came to Panama. So I did it you know, openly. And the mo most important thing is that Panama didn't ask for anything, nothing. We, didn't, we, didn't, we just asked, we just say, I, we felt it was the right thing to do. China is 20% of the world population. It's the second largest economy, the second main use of the Panama Canal, and the first supplier of the Colombian free trade zone. It was the right thing to do, so, and we did it. Without, so now, as I mentioned, so now we feel that we have a new relationship with China. We're looking forward to the relationship. There are many Chinese companies establishing, establishing their regional headquarters in Panama. There are many Chinese construction companies trying to do business in Panama. There's a large Chinese community in Panama. So I feel that they're going to play a role. I saw the investment they're doing in, in Bahamas, in tourism. I saw the investment they're doing in Jamaica, enough infrastructure. So why not establish a relationship with a country that is and one of the most important players in the world economy. That was the main reason, and I, I feel that Panama is going to be, uh, that's going to, you know, at this moment we haven't asked for anything, but I think the decision is the right decision because we're not going to ask for anything. We're just, we're just going to do uh, uh, trade, business, uh, diplomatic relations in, a, in an open way, and, and, but I think it's going to be a very positive decision for, for our people, for our economy, for our social development, because it's going to bring a lot of uh, investment to our country. It's going to bring a lot of uh, trade. It's going to bring more opportunities because Panama has been the commercial arm of Chinese companies to Latin America for many years through the Colón Free Zone. So you see, when you go to Shanghai, that's full of Panamanian businessmen buying goods to, to sell it to other Latin American countries. So I think it was the right thing to do. I think they're going to play an important role. But also Panama will play a role of say, to say the, the things that we have to say to defend our, our system. Mm -hmm. So I think that. And in the case of the United States, there will be like a, a, a new co a, another country has relationship with China that share the same values of the United States of America, the same values of democracy, of peace, of prosperity. And now you're going to have a strong part of the United States sitting with diplomatic relations with China, uh, being able to, to, to work together for the future. So I think it was the right decision. And we're looking forward to, to, to this relation. And I may probably in the, in the future, near future, I'll be traveling to, to Beijing to, and to Shanghai. And, and the idea is to set a relationship that is like a win-win for both. Great, thank you. Um, let, let, me, let me turn to the, um, some of the Americas you mentioned. You, you hosted, very successful. I was happy to be there, and we met when I was there. And I guess the big news story was the presence of Raul Castro for the first time, but there was a lot that happened at the summit beyond the, the Cuba story. The previous summit was in Cartagena, and it was on the drug issue, which you talked about a lot in yes. your remarks, and hosted by President Santos. And we just got word just a day or so ago that the next summit, which would be in Peru, in Peru hosted by President Kuczynski uh, next April, uh, the theme is going to be corruption and democratic governance. And I, I just would want to get your sense of what you hope uh, might be accomplished at that summit on this issue, which is an issue for every country in the Americas. Um, and secondly, this will be the first time that President Trump will meet uh, with all of his Latin American counterparts, heads of state. Um, and that might be a, a new story itself, uh, and what you might expect from that kind of conversation. He's had a number of bilaterals, including with you on Monday, but this will be the first time he really meets with all of Latin America. So, so looking ahead, that summit, both the theme that the Kuczynski, President Kuczynski has defined, the uh, President Trump, how do you, what, what do you hope will, will happen there? Michael, I feel that Panama is going, to be, is going to be a case study in the fight against corruption, because we're going to be able to recover more than $500 million in money from corruption without hurting the economy, without hurting the innocent, without losing jobs, without destroying the, the infrastructure project. So we, ha we, are, we, are, we are allowing our attorney general and our judicial system to do its job, to follow the money, to prosecute people, but we are protecting 
the, the, the projects and protecting the jobs. We don't want to uh, lose, uh, as has happened in other countries, they're losing millions of jobs, taking the countries into big recession, you know, creating security bonds. So it's like when you have a patient, you have to cure the illness without killing the patient. You have to get the tumor out, surgical uh, uh, procedure without destroying the economy. So, so sometimes people become, so I think that our case is going to be a case study. We're going to be able to recover a lot of assets. The truth is going to be known about bribe, about campaign donations, about everything is going to be known in our country. And we're doing it in a straightforward way because to, uh, uh, in this way we can fight corruption without hurting the people. I gave a speech at the Council of the Americas that two years ago, and I was very open about this. We have to support justice, but we have to make sure that justice doesn't hurt the innocent. Because when you go, it's like what we did with this case of a, a Panamanian company that was involved, uh, some links accused by the DEA of some links with drug trafficking. The night that I knew that that company was going to be included in the, OF, in the Clinton OFAC lease, I met the next morning with all the agencies of the United States, OFAC, Treasury, Justice, DEA, and I told them, you can come with my support, full support, but I have to protect the jobs of innocent people. Mm -hmm. If somebody with links to drug trafficking, build a hotel, the guy working in the kitchen doesn't have anything to do with that. He doesn't know where the money came from. He's just cooking uh, at, at the kitchen. So, so we did it in that way. And today, we are, we've been able to sell close to $500 million, $400 million in assets of that group to other groups that are not linked to anything. So we have protected all the jobs. So I think that what Panama can bring to that uh, meeting in Peru is the experience that we're going to put, that we have done a, we're going to be doing a, a good job on fighting corruption, getting corruption out of our system without hurting the economy, hurting the innocent, losing jobs, and putting at risk. It's like when I became to office, there was a company uh, building four hospitals. There were some people questioning that company. Mm -hmm. So if I go after the company, then what's going to, uh, one of my friends, he told me, no, you have to go after the company. He said, well, you got sick, you go to, to Boston, you go to New York, you go to Baltimore. The people in Cologne get sick, they expect to go to the new Cologne hospital. So we have to, we have to finish the hospital. So we have to sit down with them, get the money back that they pay in bribe, put them a fine, identify who was the government officer that asked him for a bribe, and, but keep the project moving forward. Finish the hospital. People need the hospital. So we did it in that way. So I feel that, that I feel it's going to be a, a very important issue uh, in, in Peru. Uh, looking forward to, to share. And I hope that by that time, in 2018, the situation is getting better. I mean, after seeing former presidents, former ministers, and former officers of government being prosecuted for corruption, it is crazy for somebody to come to a public. I feel that the future of my country, I don't, I don't, I don't I mean, it's not, we don't celebrate when something happened to somebody that did something wrong, but to be able to protect the future of the new gen young generation, that their money is respected, because corruption is not just about the money that some people took away. Corruption is also about the money that was needed to solve the problems that affect the people, and that's the fight against corruption, because you fight it for the love of these people that need that money, not for you feel about the people that took away money that belongs to, to the people that need it. So I feel that it's going to be a very important. The participation of President Trump is going to be very interesting. Panama invited, Panama invited Cuba to that summit. Right. So I think Cuba is going to be invited to the summit, has to be invited to the summit in Peru. I'm saying something today probably will, will create, but it, the, the summit includes Cuba and Panama. There cannot be now another summit without Cuba. So that will be a very interesting situation. And that could set a timetable for the New Deal that President Trump saying he wants to cut. Because that was that what the Summit of the Americas in Panama did, that we established, the, the, we invited Cuba, and that put pressure for the negotiations between the United States and Cuba that were being mediated by the Vatican to come to an ending in Panama in April 2015. Mm -hmm. So I feel that the summit is going to be a very interesting summit. It will be the first time President Trump participated with the leaders of the region in one summit, and I'm, I'm looking forward. There's so many issues going on. North Korea, and the day has just 24 hours. You have to sleep at least four to five hours. So there's so many problems worldwide. When you wake up, North Korea, Syria, Iraq, Afghanistan. I mean, if you can solve problems in the continent through diplomacy, through dialogue, that's the way to do it. So I think after the announcement of President Trump on Friday, you know, that he won the election, he's the president, he has the right, it's his right to, to define the new policies, but I think that going back to the table as soon as possible will be the right thing to do. Of course, by that time in uh, the summit, there be, should be a new president of Cuba. Yeah, and as I mentioned to you, it, that, that's a big change. It's not going to be like free and open elections, but, but for the first time, there will be a debate 
inside the part in Cuba, communist part in Cuba, of who's going to be a new president. And that the Bay Open is like a, I will say that's an opening. Great. Thank you. Uh, our time is limited, so I'm going to open it up. Um, and please be very brief. Identify yourself. We'll start with Gustav, and then we'll go to the others. Thank you. You in the back there, but we'll try to get as many questions as we can. Very quick, thank you, President, uh, for this opportunity and for your availability. It speaks volumes, uh, especially today in the U.S., that the President takes uh, questions from the audience. Uh, you mentioned Venezuela. Um, I would like to know if uh, Panama has seen an increase of drug, uh, drug trafficking activities uh, linked to Venezuela in, in, in Panama. Um, the last report of the DIA mentioned many countries in the Caribbean and also in Central America that are linked to the drug, drug activity uh, linked to Venezuela. Uh, and uh, the second part of the question would be what do you think would be the role of the military in Venezuela to help the solution in the country? Thank you. Okay. The first question, mainly the drug coming uh, through Panama comes from Colombia, from the Pacific and the Atlantic of Colombia. Usually when the drugs go out of Venezuela, they will use the Caribbean route uh, to try to get to the United States. Usually that will go uh, through the Caribbean route or to Honduras, by, sometimes to Honduras by plane. So the, the link between drugs coming from Venezuela to the United States, sometimes usually it's more to Honduras uh, by plane or through uh, the small Caribbean island uh, through the Caribbean to the United States. So, we haven't seen that. I mean, um, we have seen that. We, we're going to be brief in this visit about different issues uh, uh, by different U.S. agencies. But so far, I cannot say that in Panama. We have seen more drug coming by land from Colombia through Panama. For the first time, we, we our, our officers, our police, border police officers, killed some people, uh, four people in just one day. We ha I haven't seen that in many years that I'm in public life, that we're bringing drugs from Colombia to Panama, like backpacking uh, in the backpacks. Uh, carrying them, uh, and that, that was it. And the second question was Venezuela, the military. Well, uh, uh, I feel that, that when a president orders the military to confront its people every day, that's not good for democracy, and that's not good for the president. Because at some point, the military can say, when some, someday they will be shooting, uh, uh, shooting the, their own people, you know, their neighbors, their friends, their family. So, I think that if this confrontation keeps going on, there will be a moment where there will be a debate inside the Venezuelan government about they have, we have to change the, the strategy and the policy. Because the country is stopped for the past 60 days. You know, people are getting killed. You know, more people are going to jail. So I feel that, 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 that inside the government, there could be like, like a change in, in policy. Because at the end, I, I can tell you that from the past government, I received 100,000 tear gas grenades. I haven't used one. I mean, last week, the, the President Maduro and the Minister of Foreign Affairs said, you have to worry about the problems in Panama. I didn't answer because I, did, I didn't want to start a debate because you know, I was Minister of Foreign Affairs with him, and I have a, some kind of relationship with the Minister of Foreign Affairs, Delcy Rodriguez. So I didn't answer, but I mean, just in my record, I haven't used one tear gas grenade. I feel when you use tear gas against your people, it's because you're losing governability, and you're losing the capacity to rule your country. And you have to throw tear gas every day, I mean, even the 100,000 that I have, I, 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 hope, I'm, I'm, I hope I can just burn that someday when I finish my term, if, if, if the controller allows me to do that. <laughs> because that's, that's worth money, but yes, sir. Thank I feel you, there, will be, there will be a big debate inside the government, that, and the government, inclusive military, about policies if this confrontation keeps going on. Oh, you want to group them? I will call it change of policy. Why don't we take a few questions, sir? Please identify yourself and be brief. Uh, John Zan with CTI TV of Taiwan. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, in make relationship that Panama had maintained for over a hundred years, did you get or were you promised any economic assistance no. from China? Thank you. Nothing, sir. Uh my, 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 yeah. my last uh, meeting with a Taiwanese officer was a friend of mine who is now Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs, and he was the ambassador to Panama. And in his house, he lived in the same building that I live. In his house, I told him, please tell the president that go back and reestablish the diplomatic truce. I visited Taiwan when the Kuomintang was in power, and I went to the office, the mainland affair, that it was, the way it was called, the mainland affair office, huge building, 
where all this foreign trade was being coordinated, where all this foreign investment was being coordinated, where all these Taiwanese companies were investing in China. Uh, the uh, Vice President Xi, I think, was the Vice President of President Ma in the first term, who was the one that established this negotiation for the diplomatic tools. I was, I have to be honest, I, I'm very close to the, to, the, to the Taiwanese officers that were behind the diplomatic tools, the President, the Vice President, the Minister of Foreign Affairs, and I shared, and even many career diplomats in Taiwan advised the actual government to reestablish diplomatic truth. So I, we didn't receive any economic support. We didn't receive anything in exchange. I can assure of that. I can say it openly here in front of the camera, in front of the audience. And we did, we did what I said I was going to do in 2007 if, if I had the opportunity to do it. Yes, please. I'm Ray Tachin from the Central News Agency, Taiwan. I want to follow up the question. I'm still curious about the timing, why you decided now this is a time to end up the diplomatic relationship with the Republic of China, Taiwan. So why is the timing? And with regard to the geopolitical security issue, did you share your decision with your uh, important partner, the United States, in advance? Thank you. The, 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 like, I would say like two or three months ago, two Two small countries, what were the countries? Uh, it was two countries, one in Africa. Uh, uh, San Tome and? Sao Tome and? And Guinea. Two countries exchanged uh, from Taiwan to and recognize China. So that when I saw that, I called my Taiwanese friends and told them, look, what's going on with the diplomatic truce? So it was Panama was not the first country. Look at what happened with Costa Rica. After Costa Rica moved to China, then China and Taiwan they established a diplomatic truce for a year. So maybe after Panama changed, then they will sit and there will be a diplomatic truce for another 10 years and they can keep talking. But you know, for, uh, uh, we, did it, uh, we did it because it, uh, we felt it was the time to do it. And the, the time, it was mainly related to what happened with the two other countries because we, we saw the opening and we asked, is the diplomatic truce standing or it's over? And the message was that the diplomatic truce is over. When we received that message, then we start negotiating and, and just the the diplomatic conditions, no economic. You can see everything is falling, no economic uh, conditions for this decision. So I, I'm not gonna, you know, I just, I, and yes, we share, uh, uh, we don't have to ask. I mean, we are a sovereign state. We don't have to ask other countries what we're gonna do. We, we, we call our friends, uh, but a couple of hours before the decision, we don't, we don't have to ask for permission to decide with what country we establish diplomatic relations. We have a very strong partnership with the United States. Very strong partnership, I have to, to be clear on that. But we are an independent and sovereign state. And, and that was what even, in conversations with American uh, diplomats months before that decision, we shared with them, if the diplomatic truce is over, Panama will start a relationship with, with China. Thank you. Sir. To, to be honest, I mean, you, Taiwan has been a good friend of Panama, and I hope we're going to keep being good friends. Because of politics, I understand that, well, we have, you have to question the president. As somebody mentions, uh, we have to question the president. That's part of, of politics. But we have a very strong friendship. Me and my wife, we have a very good friendship with Taiwan. But we took the decision. We started the relationship with China. And that was the decision of the state of Panama, taking by the president of Panama. Please. Uh, good morning, Mr. President. Welcome to the United States. I have a two-part question. One. Tell, oh, identify yourself, please. Oh, sorry. Louis Vass, Independent Press. How are you doing, number one? And number two, where do you see Panama? I know, my daughter asked me to say that. <laughs> she is a fan of the president. Thank you. Uh, and the second part is, where do you see Panama in the next two to five years? Well, thank you for the first question. <laughs> the first time I've been asked that question is really nice to, to I told you that your daughter is worried about. No, I exercise every morning, but I use the WhatsApp every morning too, but I don't use Twitter. <laughs> I don't answer any attack on Twitter because I don't have time for that, to be honest. Uh, but I, I, because I'm, I, I use the WhatsApp every morning. I, I feel that the time that you have in life is just it's precious time. It's the, as I say, the day has 24 hours. You sleep four or five. I don't want to spend time fighting. I just want to fight against the problems that affect my people. So that's why I use my energy and all my efforts. So I wake up early in the morning. I exercise for one hour, two hours, and I get uh, and I get on, on the WhatsApp trying to get in contact with everybody. So I, that's the reason why I, I feel fine. I'm attacked every day, every day, three or four newspapers owned by the a former president attacked me. Even from the newspaper, I, well, I'm not going to talk about it. But uh, uh, attacked me every day. But I, I'm just, uh, I get the energy from, 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 support, from solving the problems that affect my people. So that's, that's the energy. If you get bad energy, then that's why you project your people. If, 
If you go into a town in the countryside, you have 1,000 kids waiting for you, and then suddenly you open your Twitter account, and then 10 people attacking you, you get there, you're mad. You know, they respect this. It's like you're going to Mickey Mouse and seeing Mickey Mouse angry, you know, like going to Disney World and seeing Mickey Mouse. I mean, young kids, when they, they, will, when they go to Disney, they want to see Mickey Mouse smiling, dancing. Oh, you don't know, Disney see Mickey Mouse mad, throwing things. <laughs> that could be done by somebody else, grumpy or something, but not Mickey Mouse. So when, 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 when I go to the countryside, you know, people are waiting for you. They want to see you. They want to they wanna, they wanna hug you. They want to spend time with you. So you, have, you cannot be reading Twitter the whole day, people attacking you and questioning you, because then you will going to break that. And the second question was the Panama. Panama. Oh, I see a great opportunity. <laughs> I see a great opportunity for Panama. <laughs> Panama, look, uh, the key challenge for a country must make sure that the new government, the government that they have to elect two years from now, is also an honest government. That is committed uh, with the fight for transparency against corruption. And also, one key thing of the success story of my government is going to be investing public funds with social criteria. Because that's a problem in our region. People want to invest funds with political criteria to just to uh, build parties and not build nations. I'm investing all the public money with social criteria, and that's going to be why Panama has a bright future ahead. Come to the World Youth Day 2019. Even if you're not Catholic, it's a great event. You know how, what it is to see 500,000 young kids with the flags of their country walking and dancing on the street. It's a beautiful event. I've been to Rio de Janeiro. I've been to the one in Poland. It's a just a beautiful event. The expansion of the Panama Canal is giving us additional funds, 1.7 billion this year. Now the new deal, uh, the new uh, diplomatic relations with China probably is going to bring a lot of investment, tourism from China. Panama. So I feel there's a bright future for our country. We're building massive transportation system. We're taking care of our people. And hopefully, five or six years from now, we're going to have a fully bilingual education that will allow Panamanians to receive visitors from all over the world. I will exercise more. <laughs> Uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, our time, uh, Mr. President, is uh, limited. And uh, Vice President Pence is, is going to visit. August, yeah. Can you, can you tell us, oh, just, to, just to finish up what you expect and hope? Yeah, after, af after the, the meeting in Miami, I felt that Vice President Pence decided to visit the region to follow on that meeting. And he chose Panama. So he's going to be seeing the expanded canal. And he's going to be at first, he's going to see at first hand this strong collaboration between the US government we were very close with Ambassador Philly and with all the agencies in Panama, between Panama and the United States. And also, we expect to receive President Trump in the near future, too. We invited him, too. Great. Thank you. I want to thank you thank for you, joining Michael. us this morning, President Vidala. This has been terrific. Uh, let me please ask everybody to please remain seated until the President and his ministers have, have left. But I just want to reiterate our appreciation coming by. Uh, we're going to keep this Panama flag up Thank permanently. You, we're never going to take it away. To we're going to hold it. They're right, right. Every time he comes to visit, we're going to put it up. So we, we have it here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Thanks to all Thank of you, you for sharing your time. Gracias.